of them? No. How does heat get from here to there? Air. Conduction. Remember that? Convection, Convection and radiation. <laughs> Does it bring back vague memories? No. Oh well. <laughs> Mr. Alter says you guys covered it. Well, everybody's supposed to do the same thing. All right, so we're going to talk about each of these three. Now, you don't have to solve problems. We're going to talk about these conceptually, but you will see a fair number of these questions on the conceptual test. So pay attention. Don't go to sleep. Um, so conduction happens when two materials are in physical contact. So here's kind of what happens. If I've got a block of hot iron and I put it on a block of cold ice, right here at the interface, what's going on? Well, if the iron is hot, what do you know about its molecules? They're moving fast. What do you know about the ice molecules? They're moving slow. What happens if a fast-moving molecule bams into a small, a slow moving molecule. It what happens to the fast moving molecule? It slows, it slows down. Yeah. What happens to the slow moving molecule? It speeds up. Oh, so now this molecule right here that got smacked by the fast moving molecule is moving faster, right? And so the average energy of the cold object increases and the average energy of the hot object decreases as collisions transfer the kinetic energy until it's all averaged out, until they're all the same temperature, okay? So conduction happens when heat is transferred by physical contact through collisions. The molecules are moving really fast and they just smack into their neighbors and some of the energy is transferred. If the neighbors are moving slower, then they'll be moving faster. And so these guys up here start to move faster and they gradually smack into their neighbors down here and down there and the heat slowly propagates downwards, okay? In fact, if you had hot iron, you'd probably have enough heat to melt this right here before all the heat was able to propagate downwards, right? You could actually break these bonds of the solid and turn them into a liquid. But conduction requires contact, okay? And it's just a physical collision of molecules smacking each other that transfer the energy, all right? So what exactly flows when we say heat flows? Is anything going down? If I got a piece of metal, so I got a paper clip, I stick one end in the fire and the other end in an ice cube. It, ice cube. Is there anything flowing down the paper clip? What's actually going down the paper clip? What? I don't know what I just said. What's I mean, are molecules flowing? Will there end up being more paper clip over here afterwards? No, the molecules are staying stuck in place, right? It's the energy, the kinetic energy that is flowing down. Okay, so really no, no matter flows when heat is transferred through conduction. It's just the energy that travels. Or the, that's so what's cold? If hot is lots of kinetic energy, what's cold? No. Not lots of kinetic energy. Little kinetic energy. Cold isn't a thing. It's the absence of heat, right? Talk about a little bit. So cold doesn't really flow. The energy flows, and it always flows from higher kinetic energy to lower kinetic energy. There's nothing going from lower kinetic energy to higher kinetic energy. It's not going the other way. Um, so we just say that something is cold if it lacks heat. But actually, cold is a very terrible term um, because we don't even really know what it means. And I'll show you in a little while that you can't even tell if something's hot or cold. Okay, so it turns out that how fast molecules conduct that, this energy depends on how tightly they're connected to their neighbors. So it's probably not a surprise that things that are really stiffly connected to their neighbors transfer energy nicely, like metals. And things that aren't connected to their neighbors so well don't transfer energy so nicely. So we can make a table and we can measure the conduction rates. Basically, we take a square, of the material, we heat one end, we keep the other end cold, and we measure the rate that energy is transferred. Okay, so these are in some goofy units. They're joules per second, which is watts per meter per degree Celsius. So don't worry about the units. All we care is that you can interpret the relative values of these. So if it's a big number, that means it's a really good conductor of energy, 
And if it's a small number, it's a really bad conductor of energy. So what is the best conductor of energy we got? Silver. If you wanted to conduct energy from the burner to your fry pan, because you want to make yourself a nice fried egg for breakfast, what would be the best thing you could use that could conduct the heat the best? A silver. Anybody got any silver pans? You got silver pans? They look silver. Because they're shiny? Yeah. Yeah. Are they really silver? Probably not. Why don't we have silver pans if they're such a good conductor? What? It's a rare material? How come the rich people don't have silver pans then? What are the silver pans then? No, like what are the silver colored pans? They're just shiny. Hang on, we're getting there. What? What was the problem? Why don't the rich people have silver pans? Because they melt. They melt. You got a bigger problem than being expensive. Your burner gets hotter than the melting point of silver. And so if you had a silver pan on there and you left it on for five or six minutes, it would just melt. Okay? So that's probably not so good for making an egg, right? It'd be a big mess. So what's the next best thing you want for your pan? Copper. 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 So anybody been to the Apple store at Keystone? Yes. Right across the hallway is Williams Sonoma, which Copper is a chef. really high-end kitchen store. Yeah. And if you go in there, you can buy yourself a copper pan. They're about $500 for a nice griddle. They're really expensive. Copper is so expensive that people bust apart air conditioners just to rip the, pop, the copper pipes out to sell it. So copper is pretty expensive, but it's a great conductor. So if you have loads of money and don't know what to do with it, and you want a cool kitchen, buy yourself copper pans. However, what do most of us have in the kitchen? No. That is shiny. What's next best? Aluminum. Aluminum. We mostly have aluminum. Now, aluminum can be polished so that it looks shiny, but it's aluminum. And aluminum is a good trade-off because it doesn't melt on your burner. It's a pretty good conductor, and it's affordable. So we have aluminum. If you got really nice aluminum, you might have a thin copper disc in the middle of it between two aluminum pieces. So you might have a copper disc, which helps the heat spread a little bit better without being too much. Wait, is cast iron here? Hey, cast iron is steel, Isn't which is iron, iron, which is where? Right. Oh, aluminum's 200, steel is, or cast iron is 40. So that's like what? I thought it was good. That's five times smaller. They look fancier though. What's good about cast iron? It's not a, iron is not a great conductor. They're heavy and thick. Okay, so they're very heavy, which means there's a lot of mass. So even if you don't have, even if, so cast iron isn't a great conductor, but once your cast iron skillet gets hot, it will stay hot for a long time because it has a lot of mass. It has a lot of stored energy, right? MC delta T, there's an M in there. So if you have two kilograms or eight pounds of metal and you get it hot, it's gonna stay hot for a while. Cast iron is also relatively inexpensive. 50 years ago, your grandma couldn't buy aluminum pans. We just couldn't work with aluminum very well. It was expensive, it was hard to machine. Cast iron, you just heat it up in a, in a Smith's shop and you can pound it in any shape you want. So everybody had cast iron. Okay, all right, so that's the good conductors. What if you don't want to conduct heat? What do you want? You want air. Air's a terrible conductor. What else is terrible? Polyurethane. Goose down. These are all about the same. 0 0.023, 0 024, 0 025. What do these guys all have in common? What is goose down? It's the feathers from the goose. I think you put goose feathers. I did, see? Goose feathers. Everybody knows down is feathers. Down is down. See? Now you do. So, here's the thing. Air is a terrible conductor. So, we say it's a great insulator. An insulator is the opposite of conductor. So, if something, if you don't want heat to transfer, you need an insulator. So at night when you lie in your bed and you're shivering, you want an insulator. Your body's producing heat, you just don't want it to leave. So you need an insulator, so you put a blanket on. Blankets are usually made of 
Well, in the old days, they were made of wool because wool is a lot of little tiny coily thingies that bunch up, but they are, store lots of air, okay? So, check your computer there. Caitlin, you're distracting me. I need to look it up. Things that have lots of air in them are good insulators. So, in the old days, you had uh, everybody raised chicken, and so you'd go out, does anybody raise chickens? No. You guys have chickens? Yeah. Do you guys pick the down out of the nest sometimes? Or? There's a lot of feathers hanging around there though, right? In the old days, the kids would go out every morning and not only pick the eggs up, but they'd collect all the little tiny light feathers that were left in the nest, and they'd stick them in a bag, and you stick them in a bag, and after a year, you've got a whole bag full of these, and you can make a quilt. And a feather is amazing because a feather, here's my feather, these shafts are actually keratin, which is what your fingernails are made out of, and they're hollow. So they trap air in them. And structurally, they're kind of cool. So each one of these shafts is basically a hollow tube. And to make it strong, there's little cell walls or, or little walls. They're not, not cellular level, but there's little walls that make pockets of air in each of these little shafts. And so they're light which is what you want if you're a bird, right? You don't want a two pound wing, you want a two ounce wing. They're light, <coughs> they're strong, they're rigid because they're made out of keratin with these cross supports, but they trap lots of air. And so if you can get soft ones, which are basically on the belly of the geese and the ducks and the chickens, you can stuff them in your quilt and you can get a lot of trapped air and you can put it over yourself at night and keep warm. So. Puppy coats are full of trapped air. Nowadays, we don't usually go out and pick the feathers out of our nests. We just buy a synthetic material. Basically, it's um, polyurethane. It's, uh, it's called DuPont halophil. It's, a, it's, a, it's basically the same material that white plastic spoons are made out of, but we can spit it into a very light material, almost like a foam. In fact, when you do make it a foam, you know a, an insulated cup from Rickers? styrofoam. That's exactly the same stuff as the foam on a bath. It's just been frozen, that foam, and it's all trapped air, right? That's why it's a good insulator. Hot coffee doesn't get cold because the heat can't get out, and cold drinks stay cold because the heat can't get in because it's foam. And that's why it's light, because it's all trapped air. You can take a whole cup from Rickers, stick in a little bit of acetone, and melt it down to a tiny blob the size of a penny. So a penny's worth of matter gets spun into a foam. It's a whole big 24 ounce cup. You're not about to get okay. You can get acetone at the drugstore. It's what you use for fingernail polish remover. Okay, so you can try it. So anything that has lots of trapped air is a good insulator. Anything that has metal in it is usually a good conductor. That's kind of the, the, uh, the, the story. Okay, so at home, how do you keep the heat in your house? Because if you look at the chart, glass is not a very good insulator. I mean, glass conducts, it's not, as, it's not like metal, but it's a pretty good conductor there compared to like these things down here. So glass conducts heat. If you put something cold on one side of the glass, the other side gets cold pretty quick. So what do you do at home to keep all the heat from going out your window? You what? Well, that keeps the heat from going out the wall. What about the window? You close your window. You know, you close your window, you still got glass. <laughs> yeah, so at home, if you look carefully, you'll see your window has two pieces of glass separated by a space. That space is usually backfilled with argon because it's an inert gas, but sometimes that space leaks and gets regular air in there, which has water moisture. And then when it gets really cold, you see like fog in the middle of your window, you ever seen that? That's because the seal has been broken and you've got air in here with some moisture and it freezes on the panes when it gets really cold. But in general you have two pieces of glass with air in between. If you're super duper wealthy and got a really fancy house you have triple pane windows. Triple pane windows are nice because your window still feels a little cold in the winter especially on you know when we get the polar vortex and you stay home from an e-learning day because it's too cold. Your window feels cold still um, but it, not nearly as cold as a single pane of glass. Um, but uh, you could have triple pane or quadruple pane if you wanted to, and uh, you'd really have a good insulator there. So that's how we insulate our homes. All right, now, 
it turns out that you are a pretty bad thermometer. So take your hand and put it on some wood. So the back tables feel the table. The front guys here feel the leg of your table. It's wood. Just feel it, feel how cold it is. Now, grab the metal on your chair leg and feel it. Which one feels colder? I got bad news for you. They're the same temperature. The tables and the chairs have been in here for 10 years. They are the exact same temperature. They have to be the same temperature. They've been in the room for eons. If you get a thermometer and you put it against the metal and put it against the wood, they will measure exactly the same. Okay? I've got a bucket of water back here. It is also the exact same temperature as the room. This water is the exact same temperature as the wood and the metal in this room. What are body keeping warm in this But if you stick your hand in the water, it feels really cold. It feels colder than the metal. Okay? And that's because we don't really feel temperature. All we feel is heat gain or heat lost. When heat is leaving your hand, your hand feels cold. When you touch a wooden table, wood is not a great conductor. So you don't lose a whole lot of heat. You don't lose a whole lot of heat when you touch wood. Where's wood? Right there. But metal, you lose a lot of heat. So when you're touching the metal, you are losing heat faster than when you're touching the wood. They're both the same temperature, but one is robbing your heat faster. And if it robs your heat faster, you feel colder. Okay? So anybody want to try it? Go stick your hand in the bucket. Go feel it, really. Go, stick your hand in the bucket. That temperature is the same temperature as the metal on your uh, chair. Okay. Did you just text me? Stick your hand in the bucket. Most definitely. Stick your hand in the bucket. Yeah. Was it? I can. All right. So. Okay, so when you get out of the bathtub, what do you stand on? A towel or a rug or a carpet because the floor feels cold to your feet. The floor is not colder than the carpet, they're the same temperature. It feels better, okay? But it steals your heat faster because it's a better conductor. If you want to really freeze, stand on a concrete floor or stand on an aluminum floor, then you really freeze. Okay? Anybody lay their head down on these tables? Yeah. They're kind of cold, aren't they? They, they? You can't really sleep on a, on a metal table. It, it steals your heat too fast. You get cold. You need a nice wooden table to put your arms down on and take a nap, right? Oh, All right. So we've got Convection. I gotta move here. Convection. What is convection? It is the transfer of energy, heat energy, not by contact, but by moving a fluid. You got a fluid, and you move the fluid, you can transfer energy that way. So now we're moving matter. Okay? Here's two examples. If you hold your hand over the fire, it's hot. Think about holding your hand over a candle, right? Pretty darn warm because the, there's a current of air coming up from the candle. The air gets heated by the candle. The air is less dense than the air around it, so it rises, right? Heat rises. It's not really the heat that's rising. It's the, the air that the heat is in. And that brings the heat to your hand. Or try this at home. Put a pot of water on the stove. Sprinkle some pepper in it so you can watch it. Turn the burner on, and you'll notice there's a circulation of the water inside your pot. As the water gets hot here, it rises, and so the colder water comes in over behind it. 
and it just circulates as it heats. Okay? It's hard to see in a pot with just water in it, but if there's something in your water, you'll see it kind of rolling. It's kind of rotating. Is that what they call it a rolling boil? Um, sort of. I think the original word was a roiling oil. A roiling sea is one that's bubbly. So. All right, so there's two kinds of convection. This I would jot down unless you've just got a good memory. When the movement results from the natural difference in density, Logan, you get natural convection. Natural convection is when the movement of the fluid results from the difference in density. So when you heat air, it expands. Expanded air rises. So the rising of air carries energy, and that's natural convection. It's doing it on its own. The other kind of convection is forced convection. And that's when you make the air move with a fan or a pump or something. So when you make the air move, the fluid move, it's called forced convection. So here's an example that uses both. In a house, you might have a furnace down in the basement. In the furnace, you convert chemical energy to heat energy, and you might boil water or get water hot. How does that heat get to the house? Well, you usually pump the hot fluid through the house. In the old days, that would be a radiator. Nolan? Put your phone away. Thank you. No. When the hot wa water gets to the radiator, it makes the radiator hot. When the radiator hot, it heats the air. The warm air rises, and cold air comes beneath it, and so the air slowly circulates in your room. This is natural convection. The water is forced convection. You're pumping the water through the house. Okay. If you have a really tall cathedral ceiling, or if you have a two-story house, you may notice it's warmer in the winter upstairs than downstairs. That's because the heat rises. If you have a large cathedral ceiling, you might have a fan in there. And believe it or not, in the winter time, your house will be feel warmer if you run the fan slowly to push the warm air down, because the warm air all goes up. So it, it, it's kind of weird. In the summertime, we use fans to cool ourselves. But in the winter time, we run fans slowly and we push the air down. So most fans are reversible. In the winter, you blow the air down. In the summer, you pull it up. Here's another example. If you go to the beach, so tell your mom you got to go to the beach and do some physics this spring break. On the beach, the sun warms the water. But the water has a huge capacity, so its temperature doesn't change very much. Maybe it's 65 degrees. The land, however, gets much warmer. And so because the land is warmer than the water, the air rises over the land cools over the water and forms a circulating pattern of weather that causes the wind to blow onto the shore during the day. So next time you go to the beach, during the day when it's sunny, the wind will be blowing from the water onto the shore. If you fly a kite, it'll go this way. At nighttime, though, it cools, but the sand cools really fast. The water doesn't cool very fast because it has a large capacity. And so now, the water is warmer than the sand, and the air is going up here and cooling over the sand, and it's circulating the other way. So at nighttime, when you're near a large body of water, the wind blows from the shore onto the water at night. The wind switches directions at sunset and at sunrise. So at sunset, it's usually really calm for a little while. Then the breeze picks up again at nighttime. So during the day, you blow, the wind blows onto the shore, and at night it blows out to sea. Okay, So go try it sometime. Any large body of water on a sunny day, you'll see this effect. Uh, a couple more things that are fun to know. Convection, if you have a large uh, outcropping of rocks or a big black parking lot, the air over it will get warm and rise. There will be a current of air going straight up. In California, they use that to hand glide. So they jump off the mountain, take a little hand glider, and find a big current, and they circle and go up and up and up, and then they can go around. Right here in Indiana, over there by Shooter Creek Elementary, there's a red hawk. In the summertime, he flies over the parking lot, and he circles, and he gets higher and higher and higher, and then he goes all over those cornfields looking for voles and mice, 
And when he gets really low, he goes back to Sugar Creek and gets in the upstream. And I've watched him for an hour, never flap his wings once. He made four trips, hunting trips, without flapping his wings once. Because the sun shining over the parking lot produces a convection current. Okay? A convection oven heats your food by heating air in some coils and blowing it around your food. So when your convection oven is on, your oven probably has a little fan that's like spinning, like a, like a little icon, so you know your convection. A convection microwave is one that has a little tube where it heats air like a hair dryer and blows it in on your food while it's microwaving it, and that browns the food, which microwaves don't do. There's a cool reaction called a Maillard reaction, which makes things brown, and uh, you can't get that in a microwave, but you can with hot air. So a convection microwave circulates hot air too. Okay. Uh, and of course your car engine produces all kinds of heat because there's all kinds of explosions in there. How do you get the heat out of your car engine so it doesn't melt the aluminum? You pass water through it. The water carries the heat back to the radiator and the wind blows through the radiator when you're driving fast and cools it. And if you stop your car for too long, a fan comes on to pull air through to keep it cool. That's convection. Okay? All right. Lastly, radiation. So radiation is how the energy gets from the sun to us. Through space, there's no, there's no matter. So you can't get conduction. There's no current of fluid bringing hot air from the sun to the earth. The energy is transferred through radiation, which is basically like light. Light comes in many different frequencies though, and our eyes can't see them all. All we can see are visible light, but there's other light waves that are not visible to us, we call them infrared, or microwave, or ultraviolet, or x-rays, or radio waves, or microwaves, it's all the same thing, it's all radiation, and it brings heat. So you guys, I don't know if you noticed, they put some infrared heaters out by the doors. When you come to the door in the morning, like to come in the main entrance, you felt that warm glow on the back of your neck? Come in the door tomorrow, main door, and at the door, there's that little uh, awning that goes over it, look up, they got infrared heaters down. And they, and they, yeah, they warm you by radiation. Now, it's not harmful radiation. There's all kinds of radiation. If the radiation is super high energy, we call it x-rays, and that's harmful. But infrared, it's not harmful. It's warmth. Okay, so heat can be uh, uh, transferred by radiation. All right, when you take your hand near a candle, okay, so if you, if you hold a paper clip and you stick the paper clip into the candle, the heat will reach your fingers by conduction. It takes a while. If you hold your hand over the candle, the heat will reach your hand by convection. It doesn't take a while. It's it hot fast, right? If you hold your fingers on either side of the candle, they will get warm from the glow of the candle. That's radiation, okay? So things that absorb all the energy that hits them, None of it bounces back. They look black to us. We call them black bodies. So John back there, he would be nice and toasty on a sunny day because his sweatshirt absorbs all the energy that hits it. Mm -hmm. Allison, Caden, or, or Claire, or Nolan a little bit, you guys wouldn't be so warm because the energy that hits your shirt or your sweatshirt is just being reflected back. That's why it looks white. So things that are dark absorb energy. Things that are light reflect most of it. So the classic experiment is you find a really nice snowy day and put out a black towel and a white towel. Guess what the white towel will do? No. Nothing. It will sit on top of the snow all day long. What will the black towel do? Melt. Melt all the way down to the ground pretty quickly. Can't do it today. Sorry. Otherwise, I'd put some out there and we can watch. All right. A couple notes about radiation, every object absorbs energy from radiation and every object radiates energy. You guys are radiating energy. In fact, if I could see with special goggles the right frequency, you guys would be all as bright as a 100 watt bulb. Because that's how fast you're radiating energy. And we have devices that are called night vision goggles that can see this radiant energy. And you can't turn it off. The only way you can turn it off is to die and let your body cool down to the same temperature as the surroundings. And then you won't be invisible. But then what's the point? So um, 
You radiate energy at about 100 watts. Go to calculators. Take 100 watts or 100 joules per second and multiply it by 60. That's how many joules of energy you radiate every minute. Multiply that by 60. <clears throat> That's how much you radiate every hour. Multiply that by 24. That's how much energy you radiate away every day. Anybody speak joules? Anybody know what that is? Nah. Divide it by 4,186 and we'll have it in calories. How many calories of energy do you radiate away every day? 2,000. That's why our energy intake need is 2,000. Because that's how much we lose every day. Anything your body does, cellular transport, respiration, contraction of muscles, beating hearts, activating neural networks, all of that produces heat. And that's where the energy goes. Where does the heat go? You don't just keep getting warmer and warmer and warmer your whole life. You radiate it away. You radiate energy at about 100 watts, which is why you need about 2,000 joules, I mean 2,000 calories every day just to stay you. Now, if you exercise, you're going to burn more energy. You're going to radiate more than 100 watts. And so you'll need to eat more or you'll lose weight. But that's what we call our basal metabolism rate. It's governed by the rate we lose energy. Um, in full sunlight, the sun hits us and gives us, Claire, about 600 watts of energy per square meter. So if your table was out of the sunshine and the sun was coming directly at it, perpendicular, there would be 600 watts of energy being transferred, or 600 joules every second, okay? Now, what would happen, though, if you were at an angle? So, uh, imagine I've got a big solar panel and the sun is shining on it. So if the, if, the, if the projector is the sun and it's shining on here and giving me 600 joules every second, what would happen if I turned this like this? Would it be getting as much energy? No, no it wouldn't. It would be getting a lot less energy, right? In fact, if it was like that, there'd be almost no energy on the board, right? So how much energy we get depends on how perpendicular we are, right? And you, that's important to know because convection, conduction, radiation are what explain an awful lot about our weather. And if you're going to be a meteorologist, this is going to be your life livelihood. So let me skip ahead. Here's what happens. Here's why we have summer and winter. In the, our Earth is spinning, but it's on a tilt. So right now, we are up here. See, X, that's us, Indianapolis. That's where we are. Is the sun hitting us full on? No, Indianapolis is kind of sideways to the sun, right? So the sun is low in the sky, doesn't heat very much. Winter. Six months later, the Earth is like this, it's rotating, it goes around like this, and now it's over here, and now Indianapolis is here. What's the sun doing? It's directly overhead. It produces a lot more energy every day hitting our Earth. So right now, You taking, uh, John? Okay. Right now, we are over here. We're in winter. But down here in Australia, they're in summer. Six months from now, we over here will be in summer, and Australia won't be getting a whole lot of light. They'll be in winter. Okay? So, convection. Hey, guys. Shh. Just stand up and move there, Nolan. Let the poor guy out. Don't bump his leg. Back him out. Back him out, Logan. Don't stick him. So when we talk about pressure and weather, it's all about convection and radiation. I mean, what happens when the sun shines in the Midwest? The air rises and air blows in underneath. We're going to get wind. If you're in a low-pressure region, then the wind is going to blow away from that area. If you're in a high-pressure region, the wind is blowing towards it. So all of our weather is explained by convection, conduction, radiation, and where the sun heats, 
You got it, John. Don't let him help you. <laughs> okay, last thing. If you want to keep your water really cold, you got to keep the heat out, right? So, what's that thing about? What's, up, what's going on here? How does that keep your water cold? Is it insulation? I don't think so. I think you have a vacuum flask. It's not that there's insulation, it's that the air has been completely removed. There is no matter between the two walls. And that's why it has to be steel, because steel is strong enough to keep from collapsing when you take all the air out. So you have a vacuum insulated canister, so there's no conduction because there's no matter between the inner and outer wall. There's no convection because there's no air, there's nothing in there. There's very little radiation because the inner wall of this, the inside, so she's got two layers. And if you look really carefully, you'll notice that the inner radius and the outer radius aren't the same. There's a wall in there. And they're shiny. So although the outside's been painted red on hers, the inside of this outer layer, so you got... Sit down. You've got an inner layer, and you've got an outer layer. This is exaggerated. And your water goes in here, and this surface on the inside here is shiny. It's mirrored. So that any heat that radiates away from here is reflected back. So generally, this inside section, it's not the part you see, but the wall inside that you can't see will be black, and the inside of this would be shiny. So that as this, as this, you put warm water in there, or cold water, as it radiates heat, it's reflected back. So it doesn't really matter what the outside looks like. You can put stickers and paint it. But the inside of that outer layer is shiny. It's reflective. And that produces a, a space where very little heat can get into or out of it. The only place heat can be transferred into or out of this is at the top where the metal's got to join. Okay. So that's not a whole lot of heat. If you're a firefighter, what's the primary danger in this case? Think about these guys fighting Australian bushfires. Fire. What kind of heat transfer? Radiation. Radiation. So they wear silver protective clothes to reflect the heat. But a blanket will also protect you from heat. If you have to run through a fire, so if there's a home fire and you've got to run through it to get out, wrap a blanket around you. He'll think, oh no, that'll make me hotter. No, it won't. What if it catches on fire? Throw it off. Because you're going to throw it off as soon as you get through. Let the blanket burn. Better it than you, right? Yeah. But more importantly, it will keep that intense heat from immobilizing you and burning your skin. Right? Blankets don't let heat go either way. At nighttime, they trap the heat in on you. But if there's a fire, they can keep the heat out. They slow down the transfer of heat. Okay. All right, um, so that's conduction, convection, and radiation, okay? And you're gonna have to be able to understand those three ideas. So, conduction is the transfer of heat by what? By collisions. What is required for conduction? Contact. Convection is the transfer of heat by? The motion of a fluid. Right? There are two kinds of, conduction, of convection. The fluid can move naturally, like air when it's heated, or water when it's heated, or it can be forced to move. So there's natural convection and forced convection. And radiation is the transfer of energy by electromagnetic radiation, by waves. We'll have a whole unit on what, those, what that means later. Um, and radiation is how we get most of our energy from the sun, okay? What happens in a greenhouse, guys? You make a house with lots of glass, and you make it so that the energy coming in can get in. It's absorbed, but the energy that's going out, which is a different wavelength, is trapped. It can't get out. So a greenhouse can be nice and toasty and warm because more energy is coming in than is going out. Okay. The bad news is that 
you can also make greenhouses out of chemicals. And so if you put a lot of nasty chemicals in the Earth's upper atmosphere, the energy can come in, but it can't get back out. Okay, so just like the greenhouse gets warm in the sun in the winter, our Earth can get warmer and warmer, and all kinds of chemicals contribute to that, and our temperature will rise. Now eventually, will the heat will radiate away from the upper atmosphere, but our temperature can rise significantly before it does that. Okay. Um, okay, so I think that covers everything. Keep working on homework five. Get that finished. I'll be here after school tomorrow. Um, tomorrow we'll do a lab in class, and you'll probably have a little bit of time to work on homework five maybe, but not too much. Um, and then we're going to review and have a test. So we're winding down here.